to the online teaching and learning showcase. We are going to begin with a prayer from Camillus. So for today and um, whatever the, uh, this is going on in your lives, as we come to this meeting, we bring all those things together here to, um, in order to participate, it, um, we need to bring those things, those, all the joys that we have, all the sorrows and everything, because that's what makes us who we are. So almost today, my tip to watch, I'm going to come with the mom. I'm going to go with the girl that I'm going to go with the girl that I'm going to go with. So for all these things that we're talking about and um, for all these things that we will accomplish during this time, that um, we ask the, that um, our strength be with us and that we'll always um, remember to hold dear all the things in our heart and uh, in our minds, in our in our hearts, in our, and that way we may come come we may come out of our mouths and our thoughts as good action for all these things that we'll learn today, for all the things that will be presented for our families and friends who are with us, even though we don't see them. For all these things, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Camillus. Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is our, our showcase. <laughs> I can't think all of a sudden. This is our online teaching and learning showcase for this year. And um, I just want to uh, say a few words, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn the time over to Dr. Newberry, who will go over some of the logistics for today. Um, this idea of an online teaching and learning showcase uh, for this year came about from conversations from your professional development committee in the faculty senate and with everything that has gone on over the last year with TOCC coming uh, completely online us all working at a distance um, the committee felt that there's been a lot of learning on our end uh, and that it would be good for us to share a lot of our experiences that we've had over this last year. And so what we're gonna to hear today is a series of uh, short presentations that is gonna highlight some of the experiences we've had over the last year, but also some that expand beyond that and just talk about online teaching and online learning um, beyond just this last pandemic year. Um, I wanna, Thank everybody for taking the time to be here today. Uh, while I do know there's some financial motivations, but it's always nice that uh, when professionals come together, when they're off contract, it's not a part of your required work. It's not a part of your required job, but it just shows your level of professionalism and the love you have for teaching by joining uh, us today. And, and I really appreciate everybody for being here. And um, I appreciate, um, I look forward to these presentations. And so I'm going to shut up for now and turn it over to Dr. Newberry. Thank you. I just also want to say again how happy we are that you all could join us. And uh, I have to say, especially for the presenters, uh, and uh, it's, uh, we have a really wonderful lineup of uh, kind of a, a broad range of topics. So we really didn't know who would, uh, what the topics would be. So it was really exciting to see them as they came in. Um, what I'm going to do now is just go over just a, a little bit about the structure of our time together and especially about questions. So we'll be meeting until 3.30 with a 15 minute break. Uh, so the presentations are each going to be 10 minutes. And this was decided by the faculty. We talked about the structure of this and we decided uh, in faculty senate, if we had shorter presentations, then we could have more presenters. 
And uh, so there'll be limited time for questions. So the way we're handling questions is that uh, you can put your questions in the chat box and Dr. Peterson will choose one question for each presenter and that presenter will give you know a brief answer for your question but then each presenter will get a copy of all the questions so we're envisioning that this is kind of the beginning of the conversation uh, that this conversation will um, continue because um, there's always so much to talk about when we're talking about um, teaching and learning you know, we all love it. <laughs> there's always more to say, and there's a lot to share. So the best, I think the best uh, outcomes come from good collegial discussions. So uh, that's how we'll handle the, um, the question period. So the other thing is that we ask that you keep your uh, video off, uh, that you stay muted. And also, um, we're going to be spotlighting the presenter. So if you could uh, put your view in speaker view, that would help you to uh, just highlight the speaker. So I'm sure we're all, most of us experienced Zoom users, but in my computer, it's in the upper right-hand corner and it's view and you can choose speaker or gallery. So we suggest that you choose speaker. So with that being said, oh, there is an audio cue uh, at eight minutes. So Josh will be playing that. And that's mainly for the presenters. I don't know, Josh, do you want to play that audio cue one more time? Sure. So it's going to be like a night at the Oscars. So. So that'll be the audio cue provided you could hear that. Yeah, I could hear it. So if you hear that, it's not that someone has unmuted themselves. It's that's our cue. So, all right. Well, good. So that's all that I have to say. We do have a few minutes. Uh, we can always get started early too. Um, anybody have any questions or did I leave anything out from any of the other uh, organizers? No, okay. not that I can think of. All right. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule, so that's great. Um, you know, schedules are, they are, they can have some flex time in them, right? More time for questions, maybe. All right. So let's move to our first speaker, and that is Heidi Wallace. Um, she will be presenting on reaching asynchronous students recording with Zoom. Oh, and I remembered one more thing. We will be putting the speaker's contact information in the chat box. So if you'd like to contact the speakers, um, look for their information in the chat box. So let's turn it over to Heidi. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, um, uh, Dr. Peterson and Dr. Newberry for organizing this. It's really nice to be in a kind of atmosphere um, when we're so isolated teaching from online. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. So I'm gonna be talking today about um, posting weekly recorded Zoom videos on Canvas. Oh, first of all, I'm an adjunct writing instructor here at TOCC. Um, but these weekly Zoom videos count as student attendance. So students have to summarize whatever I said in the video, and that counts as their attendance. It's usually just 100 words or something like that. So it's not a really arduous assignment. It's also a really low stakes assignment because if a student um, you know, if they're, if they're struggling with grammar or mechanics or anything like that, those things aren't graded for this particular assignment. So these videos include announcements, lectures, and journal entries. Um, they range from 10 minutes to 45 minutes, and I usually will warn students if it's a longer video so that they give themselves more time to watch it. 
So there are a lot of benefits of the weekly recorded videos. Um, and oh, I just wanted to, to double check. Everyone can see my screen here, right? If someone might pipe up. No, I'm, I'm not seeing your screen. Oh, no. OK. Oh, dear. And we practiced this, too. <laughs> <laughs> I did. OK, hang on a second. Here we go. Back to Zoom, share screen. OK, how's that? Can everyone see the screen? Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I double checked. Um, OK, so benefits of these weekly recorded videos. So as we all know, um, during this time of the pandemic, um, we've all experienced social isolation and to just be able to see a person, um, especially the instructor in charge of a class, I think um, helps to alleviate some of that social isolation, um, even if it's just to a small degree. Um, this also personalizes the course. So instead of seeing a lot of text on Canvas, um, and keep in mind that this is an asynchronous course, so we're not meeting synchronously on Zoom, um, but because students will see me every week, they'll see that there's a person behind the course. And I think that that really um, helps personalize the course. It also reaches students of varying learning abilities and strengths. So if we think of ideas of universal design and accessibility, um, you know, every student has a different kind of strength of learning. So some students learn really well by just reading through a lesson and they can understand it and absorb the lesson really well. Um, what I often do with these videos is I will detail a lesson um, on the video. So the students have a written form of the lesson and then they've got this audio and visual form of the lesson. Um, there's also these um, automatic captioning. Um, so students should be able to see what I'm saying to in the written word. Um, I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback from students about this. Uh, they, they just felt like, again, it just personalizes the course. They can see me. They can, you know, feel a little bit of a personality behind, you know, the instructor of the course. And students are able to rewatch videos when necessary, especially if I'm giving a whole lesson about something. Um, they'll be able to go back and rewatch it if they didn't understand something. Um, I just want to make a note to see Beth McMurdy of Chronicle of Higher Education. She talks a little bit about the benefits of having videos like this for online courses. So I just want to talk a little bit about inclusive and accessible teaching. Um, so Thomas J. Tobin and Kirsten T. Belling have said that advocates for the rights of people with disabilities have worked hard to make universal design in the built environment, quote, just part of what we do. We no longer see curb cuts, for instance, as accommodations for people with disabilities, but per perceive their usefulness every time we ride our bikes or push our strollers through crosswalks. So what they're saying here is that universal design benefits not only people with disabilities, but people of varying abilities um, and able-bodied people, or I should say temporarily able-bodied people. I found it really interesting that we should all expect at some point in our lives, if we live long enough, that if we don't have a disability at the moment, it's probable that we will as an elderly person. So that was just an interesting thing to consider. Um, Jason Paul Mary says, challenging the naturalization of conventional ableist technologies, we should teach students to view all technologies as assistive. So, um, you know, these different modes of learning, reading, audio, visual, all of these kinds of absorbing information are, going to assist any student in understanding what's expected of them and understanding different kinds of lessons. So I just wanted to give you an example of what my very first slide would be for um, a video that I post weekly. 
Um, so I always say what the agenda is. Everyone knows what to expect. You know, for this one, it's discussed as a, as a number three, signal phrases and MLA citations. And then I always end with a journal entry, which is kind of a fun thing that helps students practice writing. Um, I do want to mention that um, my colleague and good friend, Dev Bose, he presented at DNA College's virtual um, uh, conference, Still Sacred First Year Writing at the Tribal College. This was last week. And he was mentioning how um, being consistent with PowerPoints and being consistent with structure will help students of all kinds of learning abilities. Um, so it's good to kind of have that consistency. Students always know they're going to see this kind of slide. Um, and I just wanted to play around with PowerPoint for a moment too. I'm not sure, you might already know this, so bear with me if you do, but um, okay, I'm just going to um, stop, scare, stop sharing for a moment and then, okay, you should be able to see my PowerPoint, but it's not in slide view. Is that correct? Hopefully that is the case. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, good. So I just plopped in a text box that says today's agenda. PowerPoint's awesome because if you go to design and then you go to design ideas, you can make a really pretty slide and it's just this generic thing that you can use and suddenly I've got this slide that's today's agenda with a nice little calendar right there. Another cool thing that PowerPoint will do, um, I get these pictures from Unsplash, which is the sort of open source place where you can find images. Again, if you go up to design here and then design ideas, all of a sudden you've got these really pretty slides that you can sort of fill in and I just wanted to share that with people in case you didn't know, because I think that's really cool. Um, okay, lastly, and let me just go back to my slideshow view. Hopefully it doesn't kick off the screen share. So just considering all of the benefits, I think, uh, to these videos, especially for asynchronous students, um, things that I've thought about revising for next semester, because I'm always trying to figure out how can I improve my course or add things that will make it easier for students to follow along. Um, I need to revise the captioning to make it more accurate because the automatic captioning doesn't always record exactly what has been said. So it could be confusing for people if they are seeing that captioning. It's time consuming, but it's something that I would like to do in the future. Another thing I'd like to do is embed videos in lessons. And this is something that could benefit um, instructors of synchronous online courses. Um, because again, embedding videos of a lesson that's a written lesson in your online course could also um, give that sort of multimodal um, benefit to reaching various kinds of learners. So that is something that I want to do in my courses next semester is not only do the weekly video, but also embed videos in specific lessons as we go along through Canvas. So when I first recorded this, it was 12 minutes. I think I did it fast, but that's it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Heidi. That's very informative. Um, I'm going to ask a question that Dr. Newberry posted. Can mm -hmm. you tell us more about journal entries? Are there specific prompts you use? Yes. So I love the journal entries. Um, I Okay, so personal information. I have been journaling ever since I was 14 years old. So I have a whole box of journals and I can kind of you know, see what I was thinking as like a 17 year old and it's so bizarre to go back to it. But for the past few years, um, I have been asking students to write journal entries and um, this has been really beneficial in a number of ways. First of all, in my classes, I always talk about writing as a learned skill that you can improve upon. So there are so many students out there who think that they're just terrible writers and that's that. 
and they don't have any confidence in it. And um, it's really hard to motivate them to write if they just think that they're awful at writing. So what I try to tell students is writing is like stretching, you know, the more you stretch, the more flexible you get, or like practicing a sport or a musical instrument, you know, the more you practice, the better you get. So with the journal entries, I have compiled prompts that I've thought of or that I've found online for years now. So I've got this whole long list of journal entry prompts. And um, what I do is I have students actually buy a journal, um, something like, you know, this kind of size. And I ask them to only keep their journal entries in that journal because I'm hoping that after the class, they'll continue journaling in that same book. I don't know if that happens. I know it has happened a couple of times, but I don't know how often it happens. But um, the great thing about it is that at the end of every video, I ask them for five minutes, write about this prompt. And I don't know if they are actually writing in their journal, but at the end of the semester, I ask them, what is, what is it like to write in your journal? How did you see the flow of your writing improve? How is the style of your journal writing different from like an academic voice? Because you, in the journal writing, you can be very informal. And another really important thing is even in face-to-face -face classes, I never read their journals. It is only for them. Um, but I have consistently been told that it has helped students sort of ground themselves in face-to-face -face classes. It's a really nice relaxing way to start class. I've had students um, who are non-native English speakers who said that because she was writing, it was three times a week during our face-to-face -face class, um, she was able to write in English so much better just from the act of practicing with those journal writings. Um, so I, I absolutely love them and I, I've gotten a lot of good feedback about it. Once in a while, I got students who are like, I don't see the point of this and that's fine. I can't reach everybody, <laughs> so. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, for those who, who would like to uh, talk with Heidi more, her contact information is in the chat and we'll send you the additional questions. Um, okay. For you so you can reach out to uh, faculty with those questions, all right? All right, thank you. Heidi. So next we have ideas on how students think, thinking about their students thinking about their future an online course activity. This sounds interesting by Giselle Ramon Sabron. So Giselle, I'll turn the time over to you. Okay, thank you. Speak them to Aniap Digi Giselle Ramon Sabron, Chuck Walk Amachit. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Giselle Ramon Sabron and I teach in the Thanatham Studies program. And this past semester I taught History 125 which is Thanatham um, History and Culture Part Two, um, covering 1980s to present day. And I also taught um, TOS 230, which is Contemporary Thanatham and Native American Issues. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, so actually, I wanted to share two things um, with you all today. Um, let me start this. So um, again, I changed it to online course activities. Um, and so the first one is a leadership activity. And I really liked this um, for several different reasons, but of course uh, our students are our future leaders. And within the class, um, classes, both classes, I want them to start thinking about their futures, what they wanna do, goals they're gonna set, um, you know, what do they want to do with their degrees? You know, do they want to go on to a four-year university? Do um, and if so, uh, then what is their dream job? And how would they take um, the topic that we're talking about um, or the issue at hand? And within that leadership role, how would they address it? And um, you know, or how would they? Go to their communities, whether it's on the Thanatham Nation, um, a different tribe, or you know if they're living um, in in town or 
And I've had students also that are from out of state. So um, again, getting them to think about these, these real world issues at hand, especially in the contemporary um, issues course, the 2S 230. So um, the prompt is to give, given the issue at hand, say if it, for example, were border issues, um, and you were in a leadership position of your choice, how would you address or create a possible solution? So of course, again, we're talking about, um, you know, an issue at hand and, or a topic, and it's wanting them to, giving them this information and saying, what would you do with it from there? And so um, again, having them state their leadership role, why they would pick that role, um, and then kind of list their ideas. And this activity I've done um, in class and then also through, I do writing reflections in class um, or as, as a weekly class assignment. And so um, in my TOS 230, I ended up only having um, three students. So, it, and I started out with, I believe five or six. And so again, trying to figure out how to do activities with them through Zoom. <laughs> and it was, again, it was challenging. And it, and for me, you know, I would try to just, you know, ask a question and then I would get crickets. <laughs> and it'd be like, okay, let me ask a different way. Or, you know, again, crickets, or I'd have to call on them. And so it was, you know, and it wasn't working. So then I tried to switch switch things up and say, well, how can we do this? And so one day when I wanted to do this leadership activity, I had only two students show up that day in class. And um, I said, okay, well, I want you two to work together. Um, even if you were in separate leadership roles, still being able to pick those leadership roles, how would you work together within the Thanatham Nation, within um, you know, the community or district that of your choosing and how would you do this? And so um, my, I, and I was, I just kind of went with it to see. And, you know, my students ended up taking half of the class time because they were so deep in discussion um, of how they would address the issue. One student, she um, took the role of a, the attorney for the Thought Out the Nation. And another, she took the role as um, director of uh, tribal health for the nation. And um, the topic at hand was looking at um, our, our people that are in Mexico, our tribal members there, and how um, it's been difficult, um, you know, with having a border that divides us. And so again, they just kind of went, rolled with it and started, you know, bringing up all these different ideas of how they would address several different issues that we had talked about. So, um, but then also to writing reflections, like I mentioned, I do every week. Um, and typically those are uh, on, um, you know, through Canvas. And I ask them to think about, um, you know, the discussions we've had, uh, the readings and just sharing what they find interesting, what's confusing to them. Um, you know, or anything really that they want to share about that and also gives them a chance if they are confused and um, they can ask me questions within the writing reflection. But also too, it's for me to gauge and make sure that they're actually doing the readings. Um, and so, cause I've had students that try to do those writing reflections without doing the readings and you can tell. <laughs> um, so, uh, and again, you know, I've, found it very challenging and difficult throughout teaching online through the pandemic um, of doing, you know, activities. Cause I'm in, in person, it was always like, okay, you know, um, you three students get together and I want you to discuss this real quick. Or you three students get together, I want you to, you know, um, here's the section for you. But when you're trying to do that online and you have a really small class, you know, it it, it becomes challenging and even, Again, one day I was like, okay, I'm gonna try breakout rooms and I will have two students here, two students here, but only three students showed up. So then that defeats the purpose of having the breakout rooms. And so just having to figure out how to do that. But this was successful for me to do this 
And again, there's different ways to go about it and how to do it. Um, and then my second one activity it was is creating a brochure. And this is um, tied to their final projects. Um, and I think in the past, I've done it um, even for a midterm project. And so this is also thinking, having students think about their features as well, because how are they gonna take the information that they've learned in class and um, how they're gonna take it beyond class, you know, beyond um, TOCC and into their futures. And especially, you know, with individuals who might know anything about the topic or even the thought automation. So how are they gonna take that? And how are they gonna share it? How are they gonna explain it? Especially if they go on to a four-year university and they're in classes, um, you know, whether American Indian studies or history class or, you know, anything like that, um, how would they summarize it? How would they explain it? And so um, I really like this brochure idea, which uh, was shared with me by Ron Felix some time ago. And I've just had it and made it, you know, evolved over the years with have what it encompasses, what how it looks and what I want students to do. And so um, for History 125, it, they could pick any topic of their interests relating to um, the course at hand and, and which encompasses 1980s to present day. And so, um, but along with that project, they also had to write an essay and they had to present the brochure in class. And typically if we were in person, I would have them print it out, fold them all up and then hand them out to everybody in class and then, and myself. And then the most common application or um, application software is used, Microsoft Word, there's already a template in place. Other students um, in the past have used um, Microsoft Publisher, and then more recently, um, Canva, which is really awesome too for flyers and um, you know different creative elements. And so um, again, having that be, be there for students to express themselves and to show me you know, a topic they were really interested in um, and how they put it again in this creative element and, and said, uh, yes, they have a little small writing part to it, but again, just allowing them to use a creative side and present something really awesome for class. And so I wanted to um, show a couple of those, um, oops, um, from students for their brochures that they did. So um, you can see this, right? Yes. 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 Okay. And you have one minute left, Giselle. Yes, we can okay. See. Perfect. So um, one of my students, she is a nurse uh, in Texas, uh, and. Um, on a on base, and so she has been helping um, administer vaccine. So she put this together, and of course, also to having students understand how it looks because the way it is online, you know, and versus when you print it and fold it all up. But this was hers on COVID va vaccination, and this is how she had put it together and giving a timeline and um, information and tying it back to um, the Thon Out Thumb Nation. And because we did talk about the pandemic at the end of class. Um, and then another one here, let me go back up, is another student who is interested um, in um, Autumn in Mexico and putting her, her, her brochure together and talking about um, you know, human rights. Because I did have a guest speaker and come in and talk about um, human rights, uh, specifically to indigenous folks. And so again, just showing you, um, you know, some really awesome work that students put together. And this is always the exciting part at the end of the semester to see how they put it together because I totally leave it up to them in their hands on how they want to create it, the colors, the photos, everything, you know, but just making sure they, they cite where, um, they got the photos or, you know, the information and whatnot. So um, but that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. That's some great, those are some great activities. 
Um, we do have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Casador. He said, he asked, is this activity uh, posted as a problem that needs to be solved? Is that the, for the brochure? Um, I've changed it over the years. So for spring for the brochure, um, it was more so prompted as pick a topic that you find interesting um, that ties to within the class, whether we talked about it or not, um, but relatable to the Anatham history and culture um, that ties to tribal sovereignty that you can, that the student can try tie to tribal sovereignty. Um, uh, preserving not from Hamathog, and then also to human rights, and how that topic at hand ties to one of those, or if not, or, you know, or more than one of those, and then putting it in the brochure and explaining it as, as if the person or audience at hand does not know anything about the topic, or the Thanatham Nation. And so that's how I did it this semester with the students. But for the other one, um, the leadership activity, yeah, it's it's set up like a problem solving. Like here's the issue, here's um, you know the situation at hand. What would you do in a leadership role to start addressing, um, or you know possibly addressing uh, and drafting a solution for um, for that? Great, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. All right, and uh, uh, Giselle's uh, contact information is in the um, chat. And if you have any additional questions for Giselle, uh, please put them in and we'll, we'll make sure she gets them so that uh, we can find out more. Uh, so moving right along, our, our next presenter is uh, Teresa de Coker, and her topic is creating a group project for teaching an asynchronous online course in nutrition, diabetes project example. And I love, I, I'm excited for this topic because man, group activities are difficult on in online formats. So uh, Teresa, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Curtis, and uh, this is a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, I know last, last year we were all kind of scrambling to come up with activities and ways that we could put some of these projects that we know are so important and, and um, uh, teach in a way that's accessible to all students. And as it turns out, you know, I think we can teach we're very well uh, online uh, in an asynchronous or synchronous format and take some of these projects or some of these things, these learning activities that we did and, and, and put them into uh, this format and have it work for, um, for all. So this one in particular uh, is, a, is a group project um, and you know uh, piggybacking on the, the last presentation, this is also a, a brochure that I did with my students. You know, as we know that the um, group uh, projects are really important, I think, for their learning in um, the workplace, they'll most likely be doing uh, projects in groups and likely if they move on to uh, uh, from TOCC to another university or college that they will be doing a lot of group projects. So this kind of prepares them for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that also in addition, uh, online, uh, or I'm sorry, group projects really facilitate deeper learning uh, and just stronger information retention. Uh, it really helps them to, to work as a team in general. So I also am going to say, and this has happened with some of my students, that it gives these students, especially in an asynchronous format, to connect with each other. And I think that's really important. Um, and I had a student last semester who said that they became friends with someone, which is exactly what I was hoping for, that they would make connections with others uh, for as friends uh, to network, you know, uh, just in some way to, to connect, to reach uh, out to others. So, you know, this uh, takes advantage, you know, how do you do that? How do you have a group project? Well, you, um, one thing that, that I did was have a, a group contract. So you can, you know, set up the groups in various different different ways, if you like. Um, I tr I've tried a couple methods. The last one was just alphabetically putting people into groups. 
um, and uh, having them reach out to each other via some kind of video conferencing software, WhatsApp, you know, something they have on their phone, you know, it doesn't have to be Zoom. And if they have, if they want help, they can reach out to me and I can set up a Zoom meeting for them and facilitate that. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if, if I might change that on, for the summer session um, and just make it mandatory and then they can set it, maybe sign up for particular slots of time that I have available and they could um, maybe we could set up the groups um, by, you know, who can meet at this time. I'm not sure, but um, sometimes people are a little hesitant to reach out. So um, this, this has worked really well with a lot of students, but I just want to make sure it works for every group. Um, and uh, I found it a little challenging for some students to, to connect, um, but it did work really well for a lot of groups. So uh, and one thing I think is really important with the T is having those team contracts. So with, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, and also to have uh, peer evaluations so that they know that um, how they work as a team will be used in the evaluation process for their project. So this team contract really formalizes expectations from the group. Um, and um, the members agree upon, you know, what, the, you know, what roles they'll play, uh, what, what they'll be responsible for. And in this case, it's a brochure, you know, what parts of it they will do um, and what their, uh, their, you know, how they will communicate and what time, time frame uh, and what their responsibilities are. So, and I think it really does also having the team contracts helps them to um, really, uh, know that that it is important that this is part a really important part of the process it's not just making a brochure it's working together that there that is is important part of this the, this particular project and again you know they if they would like I, they could set up a time with me and i can facilitate that uh so this is an example of a the team contract um and so they'll negotiate the terms and i have this set up for them and they can um you know, alter this if they'd like. They all each need to sign the contract and submit it um, within a week. So they'll have a week to uh, to reach out to each other uh, and then uh, get this back to me. And most of the groups were able to, well, all the groups were able to do this within a week's time. And the peer evaluation, again, I think it's important because they know they're gonna be evaluated by their peers. So they're more likely to, uh, to work well as a, as a group, uh, as a participant of a group, but also it'll reveal some participation issues. I think a lot of times in people who do put a lot of effort into these pro group projects, you know, they don't necessarily like group projects because they feel like, you know, other teammates are, are, are you know, getting credit for something that they've done. Um, and so really this helps to reveal any kind of uh, discrepancies there, you know, people who weren't participate, participating and others who who were, um, and then I can use that to evaluate them um, for the for the assignment. Um, and uh, and really the the, the peer evaluation form uh, is just based on uh, what the criteria they've used to evaluate each other, um, and you know if they you know adhere to their to their team contract. Um, and. Uh, I'll answer any questions. I realize I made that a little short, but here's my contact information. And and again, I, I just want to iterate that you know, this project you know you could do a, a team a team a uh, group project with any any kind of uh, any kind of project, and it worked well with this particular one, um, building a brochure on uh, diabetes. Uh, and uh, they what they the the products what they came up with. I didn't feel like I wanted to share because some of them are a bit personal, but they, they came out really well. Um, and uh, the idea was to, for the particular project, was to, um, it was an educational brochure to help to you know, educate their either family members or community members as to what diabetes is uh, in simple terms and, uh, and specific uh, traditional foods excuse me, my, my, my phone, uh, and um, how they can, uh, you know, use uh, traditional foods or otherwise to, um, to help to manage the disease. So I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, the question that, that, that seems to be burning is how and when do you intervene when a group member does nothing or very little? 
Right. That's that's challenging. I mean, I have to reach out to them uh, individually, and if if I don't hear from them, if they don't if they don't respond uh, via email um, or yeah, so I mean, I use email to reach out to them. If they if they don't respond, they just simply don't get credit for the assignment. If they're not participating in the project and they don't uh, respond to their their teammates, then they simply just don't receive any credit for it. Unfortunately, but I'll reach out to them more than once. Um, and, uh, and, and then they, you know, if they haven't participated in the team contract, they'll see that also that they got a zero on that assignment, uh, which comes before the brochure is graded and they'll see that and I'll write a note there saying, are you participating in this project and so they'll still get that message as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good stuff. All right, and uh, again, if uh, you have any other questions for Teresa, her contact information is in the chat as well. Um, and it looks like uh, some some other faculty have some group projects. So I'd, I'd recommend maybe doing a, a group email or something and, and take this conversation further uh, because group work is really important. It's a challenge on the online environment, but as Teresa shows, it, it is something that's doable. Um, and so I'd encourage you all to reach out to each other. Okay. All right. Our next presentation is by Martha Burgess. And Martha, please correct how I'm saying this, but I think it's Am um, Masada. Mas I can't. So please help me with this. It's on discovering April, April's plants life with colors, Kim Dog and Science. I'll turn it over to Martha and please help me with the pronunciation. Uh, thank you, Curtis. Uh, it's Uamashat, Yellow Moon. Nyesis, Wum, Nyesis, Wum, Mama Shamatham, Skuk, Runas. A special, special Monday to all of you, my, my mentors and fellow fellow faculty. Abana Jik Martha Ames Burgess, Gamma Ab Hu Amjit Stuk Sean, Gam Hu Mas Virginia Tham, Nichipkan Wood Mashjam Tham Adjunct, Iab Tahona Autumn, the Mashjamakutam. I I'm an adjunct here at TOCC and I've been teaching, I, I taught for three years, the Tahana Autumn Ethnobotany class, which uh, <laughs> it's a totally online, um, on hands-on experiential kind of a class. And so I've taken it as a major challenge, of course it was when COVID hit, um, to bring this hands-on experience to <laughs> totally online. So um, I, I had worked on uh, many curricula packages for uh, the hands-on, but this time I'm trying to, with the one mashat exercise, I'm trying to do a wrap-up month, that, sort of following the end of the whole, uh, what's led up to um, the end of the semester, do a summary kind of month that, has the students bring together what they've learned, okay? Um, so um, I'm a believer in beginning with the end in sight. And so I'm gonna start with what I'm expecting of my students. And so um, this is what happens in the month of April, the Uamashat in uh, Tahuna Autumn, uh, and in, in the homeland, in the Sonoran Desert, the desert turns yellow. And so uh, I'm trying to adapt this class. Um, can you see it okay? Is it, is it visible? Um, it's good, it's good. So using April as sort of the summary month of, uh, of the semester, trying to bring in different learning ways, like the senses, color, for example, for sure, because well, Mashat is so vivid here in the desert and hopefully in other parts of the hemisphere. Um, 
and bring in Himdak, which is, you know, so essentially a part of the plant life here, and the science, bring it all together. Okay, so what I'm expecting of the students is at the end of this month, and I'll go through the exercises with you, I want them to be able to present a, a slideshow to each other in a synchronous class that summarizes, it, it depicts the plants that they've chosen. They're gonna choose four different favorite plants that are blooming or fruiting um, and, and bring together the knowledge that they've studied online, li library resources, and with interviews with elders. The, uh, the native name, the indigenous name, uh, and, and this is designed so it doesn't have to just be residents of the, of the Sonoran Desert. It can, be, it can be adapted to anybody from Washington State to Washington DC or to you know, Northern Mexico or whatever, um, or the Great Plains. Um, so I wanted to be sure that uh, we could take in anybody's environment. <laughs> um, and even in the Southern Hemisphere in our April time, uh, there will be things change, fall colors happening. So wherever they are, wherever the students are, they'll be able to adapt this online exercise. Here's a case where they can um, talk about the, here the yellow fruits in the spring, in April, the barrel cactus fruits are still yellow. Um, this is just an example. This is to spur and inspire the students to do their own explorations because once they see the techniques, then hopefully they'll be able to go out into their own environments and, and find the, the plants that they want to delve into, the four plants that they uh, want to teach about, learn first, learn about, and then teach about. This is uh, the Chiordim, the Choya, Chiordim Hiosik, Choya bud and flower. And I want them also to use this as a springboard to interview wherever they are to find elders, to find traditional people, particularly indigenous of their area, to find the people who know the old stories, know the names of the plants, have the traditional ecological knowledge. And if they can document that, so much the better to be able to share it. And this is uh, Juanita Ahilbat, um, one of my mentors. Um, so another example, this, this plant, the E. by Hiosik, the um, prickly pear flower will produce now it'll produce food in the spring and then again in the late summer. Um, so I'm, I'm really not showing these to you for the content so much as the concept of what I want the students to be able to explore for themselves in their own habitat. So there'll be many different kinds of, of plants, trees, succulents, in this case the the um, foothills Palo Verde will be um, just exploding with color, it still is in some places, but uh, during that lunar cycle of Uamashat, um, it'll be turning the, the foothills yellow. And then later on, like the first week in June, it'll have fresh sweet peas on the, on the, the in its pods. And oh, it ties in beautifully with, um, Teresa de Coker's nutrition um, unit. It's, uh, it's just so, it's so rich to be able to connect the food with the plants themselves. Um, in Uamashat, the mesquite goy will be blooming and, and many stories can be told about that. But the, the first step is the the gifts that it'll be giving to its pollinators. And that's another component of this, um, wanting the students to explore the ecological relationships of these important plants 
that they are learning about. Um, what's the role of their four plants with uh, who eats it, who pollinates it, who um, needs it in one way or another, including people, but part of the larger community, the uh, Iwamp, the, the, the bigger community is the community of life around them. Okay, here's my, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my contact information. Oh, I have a blog, savorthesouthwest.blog, that has much anecdotal information about traditional food uses. Um, and then on my website. So um, if time permitting, uh, I'd like to- Martha, just, yes? you, have, you have two minutes. Okay, um, maybe I could just give a little overview because uh, the idea of using the Tahuna Autumn homeland and the plants here uh, as a, like a template is um, hopefully a being a springboard for students anywhere. So it'll provide an online set of independent exercises um, for the students to, to go and to document, hopefully it'll inspire them to go out and document four of their own most interesting native plants and to research them. So, um, and it, it really is an evaluation in a way of all that they've learned so far in the class. Um, the most important, <laughs> the first obvious uh, Himdag connection, the cultural connection is the very name, the idea, the concept of the yellow moon, the, the, that moon cycle when the whole desert turns yellow, but it may be totally different in other, other students' environments. It's, but it's a, a way to get them thinking about their own homeland. Um, and then we'll have other cultural connections um, as they learn the names, the traditional names of the plants and the stories and other significant and traditional connections. Um, and Camillus has supplied, he's going to be supplying several different autumn terms. And hopefully that'll be inspiring students to find their own language terms if they happen to be in uh, Navajo land or uh, Ashinaabe or wherever. Um, and in addition, to Southern hemisphere students as well. So the Hi, land- Martha, you have yeah. uh, just some last thoughts. Okay. Anyway, the objectives bring many things together and uh, cultural, scientific, and research ways and having people see their own homelands uh, in new ways. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful, Martha. So the the, the uh, question that uh, we have is from Sharon Parker. First, she says, mm -hmm. these images are beautiful, uh, but her question for you is, do students in urban areas have any problem doing this assignment or do they have other options if they do? Uh, yeah, I had to work with some students like that that couldn't get away easily. And so, um, yeah, we've worked out that they could even use weeds, wild weeds that may invade their sidewalks or their parks or, um, or other cultivated plants that we know are our native cultivars. Um, so yes, it's a real good point. I don't want to discriminate. I want to make it possible for all students to participate, but we'll find a way to work with them. Thank you. Great, thank you, Martha. And uh, as usual, our, Martha's contact information is in the chat if you want to get any further information on her uh, assignment and her activity. Um, we are a little bit ahead of time, but that's okay. So I am thinking, let's go ahead and take our break and we'll come back at 2.20. So you get a little extra break. using Canvas for academic advising and student success. So I will turn it over to you, Marcia. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I played around with this concept in the last year and actually uh, I invited everyone that wanted to be in this portal um, and some people did. And um, I've totally rearranged it and I've gotten some feedback from students. And of course, even these ideas here, it's just, it's just great because I think we can do a lot of different things with this. I'm gonna share a short PowerPoint and then I'm gonna show you um, what's happening with what I did in Canvas. And I'm not moving. Hmm. I'm frozen. Totally frozen. Oh my goodness. My time is running out. I'm gonna try again. We can take a few minutes off the end, so good. no worries. Oh, yeah, I, I haven't started the timer yet. So. Oh, good. There we go. Okay, so perfect. I'll what start. I want to share with you is um, a, a concept that I put together as I was trying to advise students and then have them in my classes at the same time. When I first came in 2019, I had 25 to 30 students on my advisement list. Now I have 135 with all the changes. And so I was trying to think of ways that I could support students. As we know, we all really want students to be successful. We're trying to figure out what's, what's the best way. How can we help them learn? How can we help them move along in their academics? If you're an advisor, um, you just kind of, you're, you're doubling the task there. Um, the research that I have done in my dissertation and also some future, uh, some other research papers um, have really come, some factors have floated to the top in regards to what really makes uh, students successful. And um, three of the things are, uh, one of the big things is that students have to have goals. Uh, if they don't have goals, they can't move on. Um, they, they need to have tools to be able to be successful, the resources and things. And then they need to have support and connections. And with those three things, the challenges and the barriers really get minimized. And so with those ideas, um, I put together some, um, some things in Canvas that I think have um, really been helpful. So as we all know that um, I had, I'm just gonna keep on going. <laughs> So in adult learning, one of the things that we learn with our students is they like to see things, um, they hear things, but what they're hearing is not retained very long. And as we all know, as we're getting older, we don't retain what we hear either. So I'm really focusing on seeing, thinking, doing, and then the relational piece, the relationships that help us learn, not only with the faculty and advisor, but with the students. I'm not sure there's a, there's a square here that just won't even come back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just gonna stop and go back. I don't know what's going on. This really doesn't happen in my classes either. So there we go, I love it. Okay, so um, using a systems approach to student success is kind of the foundation of what I did. Um, that students need resources, they, we need to address time and environment and learning conditions, and that we need to provide implicit and explicit strategies, which means that we need to show them how to do things and then we need to provide those background supports. So some of the benefits of using Canvas as a student resource to support student success is it provides a tangible go-to resource um, and it's relative to the student's program of study. So actually some of the students' uh, feedback I've gotten is, oh, wow, do other faculty have this resource? And I said, not that I'm aware of, but that they need to be checking in with their faculty. Um, it creates uh, explicit information and guides that support informed planning and learning so that we're providing students with information um, 
one of the things I have an exercise with students in the beginning of my classes where we do a human resume. And one of the questions is, what is your greatest fear uh, starting this class? And eight out of 10 students say, my greatest fear is not passing this course. So students are coming in with a lot of uncertainties and yet they really wanna do well. Um, this Canvas project informs the student of universal expectations and resources. So I have provided information in Canvas that will help the students in all of their social work courses and also expands to their uh, learning and supports in the other courseworks outside of, of social work. It also creates a platform for building a learning community. And that's one area that I'm really open to feedback about because um, it's been real difficult with COVID uh, to do the collaborative kinds of things I wanted to do in Canvas. So that's kind of my goal for this next semester. And um, it supports transfer planning and academic goal development. And like I said, if students have goals, um, that really helps them stay in school, be committed, kind of go over some of those, those hurdles. So kind of the goals and outcomes that I, ex that, that I have put together, it's like, what, what are students gonna get out of being part of this portal? Um, they understand the what's, why's, how's, and when's in regards to the social work program and their curriculum and their academic planning. They understand their program of study, helps them make informed decisions, and it gives them some tools um, that are not just social work, but they're tools for being successful at TOCC. Um, and that improves learning and retention outcomes. And uh, a lot of that is through encouraging peer collaborations in this Canvas portal. And this is the piece that I still feel like I really need to develop this next fall and get students feedback for doing it. And it develops lifelong learning readiness. So students wanna know about, you know, what are BSW programs like? Um, what do I have to do to get ready? What are the programs? So with that, we're gonna take a look. So here is my Canvas dashboard and I actually have built, um, and Tim gave me a sandbox last year and we started playing with it and we called it social work advisor dashboard. It says, you wanna know the difference between a master and a beginner. The master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. And so I really want students to kind of enjoy going into this portal um, and realizing that to be a student um, isn't easy, but it's, it's challenging, but it's also really exciting. So when we open it up, I welcome the students and I let students know kind of what this portal is. And I encourage them to click around and use whatever modules that they might want. As you can see right now, I only have some things open we're not using collaborations or Google Drive right now, but I anticipate that we will uh, in the fall. So we, we start with uh, getting started. And every module that I have developed has an introduction that explains what it is. And so this is their, your social work student advisement room. And I talk about how it's organized and the different modules that they can go into and that they can find information or supports or tools. I'm not gonna go into every one of them, but I talk about, uh, there's um, you know, a link about, about me and advisement. The next module really looks at academic programs and plans. And so um, it's really talking about understanding your options and there's a little blurb under each option and the program code. So it explains what kind of programs you can, yeah, are available at TOCC. Um, and then what I do is I have different requirements. So I'll just, um, I'll give you one example. So this is the AA social work requirement. And they can literally click on these and download these and it, um, it shows this is a general description of the AA and social work, but then it's an advisement guide that lists all the courses that they need to take 
in order to be uh, to get their AA. I've also developed one for a dual degree plan with AA and ECE, and I already have students that are jumping on that. So they're sending me emails, is it too late? Is it too late? And it's really not that many more credits to do. So I put together a plan um, that fits that. Um, the, I also have a link for program of study declaration. So if students have not done that, I encourage them to do that. Then I have all kinds of templates and forms. So, um, Click on this one. So I talk about how important it is to have a plan. Now remember, if students have plans, that helps them kind of solidify their goals. And so it's really important. And so I let them know a little bit, um, you know, taking writing 101 and 102 first, looking at APA standards, um, a module that I have for writing guides, um, looking at math, um, consulting with admissions if they to decide what their math level is. Um, and then, of course, working with IRIS if they have less than 24 credits. Um, I have a lot of templates, including, including a course description. So in here I have course descriptions. Um, and in the course descriptions, it also, if you click on this, it talks about two minutes left. Marcia. Okay, two minutes. So that's all the advisement stuff. I'm going to scroll down. Here's question and answer and resources. So I give them everything. Um, and these are things that are taken off of the TOCC website, but they're put in all in one place. Then we have um, planning for success. So now we get into successful learning. And we've, I give them the tutor center and different kinds of materials on how to be successful, how to organize, how to plan. Then I want them to get excited about social work. So they um, get to look at all different, uh, there's just a plethora of stuff in here, including a YouTube video that talks about what is social work and what kind of jobs could I have? And the last but not least, I look at writing guide for social work students. And so I literally have a page and we start about what scholarly and academic writing, and then what is gonna be expected of them in all of their social work courses. And I give them lots of tools. And so we're looking at um, best practices and communication and we look at APA writing. I give them all kinds of tools. So as an example, um, they've got the writing tutor and I've given them a toolbox that gives them all kinds of examples and YouTube videos in regards to how to set up their papers and things like that. So one of the things I wanna do, oh my gosh is um, one of the things I wanna do is really get them to, to know what's expected ahead of time. Um, I believe what I plan on doing is integrating this into um, all of my courses so that as an assignment in the beginning, students will actually go into this portal and they will um, have group, now I'm getting some ideas on group assignments where students might look at one particular area and maybe do some bullet points about what is most important, what did they find most valuable in that area. Um, I also have a section that talks about transferring and I have information from NASU and ASU and program planning. So these are all kinds of things that help them develop their goals give them tools for writing, um, for being able to navigate registration, um, accessing different um, courses, things like that. Um, some of the areas that I wanna continue building is um, getting students to take more ownership for this Canvas portal so that they actually are telling me what kinds of things would they like. Um, I have special events and announcements that, uh, that are, are, I've got a module for it, but we'll be adding information, job openings, little trainings, activities in the community. 
Um, and another piece that I don't have in it yet is really looking at using the role of Zoom and Netiquette and you know, what does, a dis what does a good discussion post look like? What is expected when we talk about critical thinking? How do we respond to each other? Hi, Marcia. Yes. That's it, <laughs> last thought. Last thought, <laughs> last thought is um, I think uh, the other thing too in the portal is you were really looking at resources. So students having resources for self-care, time management planning, I have templates in there. Um, and just helping them be more organized in, in their work. So uh, that is it. Thank you, Marcia. Um, and if you, would, if you are not a member of this now, because since you, if you have become a member earlier on in the year, you'll notice that it's, it's changed a lot. So please feel free to go in there. If you like this module, model, I can push things, I can push the whole thing over to you if you want, and you can change and make it how it fits your program. Um, and if you um, are not the head of a program, um, but wanna use this for student learning, you could actually, let's say you teach uh, a number of different courses and you have the same expectations in this, each course for writing or reflection paper standards or different things. You could actually have a portal like this where you could direct students to and get them excited. Um, and it's really about removing those fears and helping them uh, feel encouraged. Great, thank you, Marcia. Um, I think this is a wonderful resource. Uh, every once in a while when you guys receive reminders from me, sometimes it's because Marcia did an announcement and uh, it reminded me that I needed to remind everybody to do something. So even, even for her non-students, it's a wonderful resource. Mm -hmm. um, but we, are, uh, we do have a question from uh, Dr. Newberry and a few others have been curious about this as well. How do you get your students into Canvas? Do you invite those students who are, who are, on, who are in your course or all on your advising roster? Well, what I started with is um, Tim helped me and we entered every email address of every student on my advisement roster. <laughs> and of course that helped because that kind of weeded a few out because students are like, I'm not social work. Um, but that's how I started it. And, and thinking in the fall now, I will definitely make sure that every one of my students in my courses um, are added. And so you can go in and add them as people, as members, and then they get an invitation to accept. So it's, it's an invitation and they accept it. And, and of course, I let the students know ahead of time. This is, you know, I show them the first day of class. Here's your portal. Um, if you're not interested in social work per se, if that's not going to be your program, but you're just taking this course, check out the portal anyway, because there's a lot of modules that aren't directly social work related. And it helps you kind of cruise around and look at careers and different things like that. So, what a, so to answer your question in the beginning, I added everybody on my list and sent invites. And then I also sent notices, like if you haven't accepted your invitation, I'm gonna send another one. Um, but I'm going to integrate this more actually into all of their social work courses so that it'll be the go-to place, even for writing standards. Great. Thank you, Marcia. And uh, we'll send uh, more questions that have been posted uh, to you a little bit later. And of course, uh, Marcia's uh, contact information is posted for anybody who wants to uh, contact her more about this. So our next presentation is by Dr. Teresa Newberry, and she's going to be talking about culturally responsive active learning strategies in an online biology course. Uh, Teresa, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. And I just want to take this time to let everyone know that I have enjoyed all of the presentations. Um, I've really learned a lot. I'm very amazed and inspired. <laughs> 
So the uh, presentation that, as uh, Dr. Peterson just said, I'll be talking about culturally responsive, whoops, I'm one slide ahead here, uh, uh, culturally responsive active learning strategies in an online biology course. So I really focused on the cultural responsive piece because some, I think a lot of uh, folks were asking, well, how do we do culturally responsive curriculum in an online environment? And I myself was asking the same question. And so I just, uh, I found uh, many ways. I found it was actually not as hard as I thought it would be. And so I wanted to share some of my strategies. So just as an introduction, the um, course that I'll be talking about, it's uh, Environmental Biology Bio 105. It's a online asynchronous course. And here's a picture of my home page. And so basically this course covers just general environmental issues, clean water, clean air, biodiversity, climate change, um, and basically keeping Mother Earth healthy and learning how to live in a good way on the earth. So some of the active learning strategies that I really like, with, well, I'll be talking about a couple of them, but I'll be talking about discussion boards first, as well as individual reflections. And so I find discussion boards to be really, really powerful in an online class, especially an asynchronous class where they, they really take the place of that classroom discussion. And I find that if you have questions that are engaging and if you structure it in a really good way, you can have very, very powerful um, discussions um, in that area. Uh, and then secondly, I really like the individual reflections. And, and I have to say, individual reflections are kind of my, my go-to in my science classes when I'm trying to incorporate culture, because everyone has a different culture, and there's no one right way to really talk about people's perspectives. So the, the individual reflections really gives uh, students an opportunity to integrate across differing perspectives. <clears throat> so I wanted to add in here digital media. That's not something that the students do, but it's something that I have found in an online environment that has uh, really enabled me to bring in um, different perspectives. And it's actually more powerful than in a face-to-face -face class, because in a face-to-face -face class, you have to get your guest lectures in and you're limited by time and space. But really with this online environment, there's so much out there in terms of um, digital media. So I really rely on that. Um, and then from, you know, from the Tonawatsum Community College perspective to bring in the voice of the elders. So here's an example, uh, just one example of a discussion. And in this uh, um, part of the class, I have covered biogeochemical cycles. So that's how water, um, you know, carbon, nitrogen move through the, the different, you know, earth um, components. So it's really, you know, physical science. It's really your basic science. And so I then have a, um, you know, I've been working with uh, Camillus Lopez, and uh, many of us have, but I asked him to do a video on the four elements and talk about earth, air, fire, and water from the autumn perspective. And it's about a 20 minute video. We found that that's a really good um, length for to hold students attention and really give them some good information. So they learn about, um, you know, carbon, water, um, moving through the Earth's environment in a basic standard scientific perspective. Then they hear Camillus's perspective, and then they have to answer uh, what are the, basically find at least one point that's similar between the two perspectives, and then uh, reflect on are there any differences in the natural world. So with this, I didn't know exactly how this would work because it was the first time I'd ever done this, not in a face-to-face -face setting, but it was really amazing. The students 
came up with some very, very unique perspectives. And I was just really enjoying um, reading the discussions. And of course, as I always remind my students, this is a discussion, so they have to have a conversation. So they have, um, they have to respond to at least one student and then respond to another student. I give them examples on how to do that. Here's another uh, discussion. It's uh, indigenous knowledge and sustainability. So in the class, we've covered what is sustainability. And then in, in this discussion posting, they get an opportunity to bring in indigenous perspectives. So I have a video by Dr. Vandana Shiva, who is uh, from India, and she has a lot of really amazing perspectives on sustainability and her work in particular is with seeds. And then there's a video by Albert Wigan, who is an Aboriginal Australian, and he tells his story, he tells the story of his family and how their knowledge has helped them survive. And there is a reading here by Dennis Martinez. So uh, they here down below, you can see, do you agree with these authors that indigenous ways of knowing have much to contribute to environmental sustainability? Can you give an example from your own culture or knowledge of traditional cultures. So you can see, I always like, you know, especially online, uh, in these online courses, we've had much more diverse students. So these open-ended questions really help them bring in those uh, perspectives. And I do have a discussion rubric. So I remind them to use it as a guideline. And this last piece here is a reflection paper. And so in class, we've talked about biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity um, to the health of the earth and also to humans. So in this um, reflection, they reflect on how core values can help preserve biodiversity. And so this is a video by Camillus on the core values. And so then they have to ask themselves, um, you know, yes or no, can the core values help preserve biodiversities, provide at least one example, and then again, reflecting on their own culture, how, what is the value or ethic from your own culture, um, you know, uh, to help, that can help you preserve biodiversity. So again, very open-ended um, in terms of different people's cultural perspectives. So the last, uh, example that I want to show you is problem-based learning. So it's a problem-based learning activity that I do in this class. And so before I go into the details, I want to talk a little bit about problem-based learning and, and problem-based- Two minutes left, Teresa. Thank you. Problem-based learning is by its very nature rooted in the hymn dog because it really, um, I mean, if it's designed right, it really brings in the knowledge of the community. It brings in the knowledge of the students. And the idea is the problem that's chosen is, is relevant to the students um, because it's generally collaborative in nature. It brings in peer learning and values relationships and reciprocity. Um, and it gives, again, opportunities to make those connections between Western science and indigenous knowledge. And then it finally, it empowers the students as as legitimate knowledge holders, like they're in charge. We've seen some really good examples already of um, problem-based learning. But in this assignment here, uh, what I have them do, it's an intro class. So I wanted to do a, a project on climate change, but really it was too much for them to do a climate change uh, action plan. I do that in another class. In this class, I really wanted them to uh, work on building a coalition and to think about in their own communities where they are personally, how could they bring in different elements of their community to uh, get folks, you know, uh, activated about climate change. And so that's what this coalition action plan is. And it has um, three components. The part one is they have to define their community. So they have to define, define what is their community? Is it a tribal nation, district, village, town, or neighborhood? Um, they have to think about how they would communicate. They would have to, when they choose this community, uh, what is their, you know, what, um, 
what stake do those community members have? And they have to think about food, water, and health. And then they have to think about how they would communicate with these um, community members, including like a timeline. After they invited this coalition together, this is all hypothetical because it's a plan, they have to create a um, presentation and they have to basically teach their coalition members how climate change is impacting food, energy, water, and human health, as well as community well being in their community. So, they, in this, they draw on many things that they've already learned in the class. So, they've been working on this already um, in this series of assignments called Climate Change in Your Region. So, I have everything is scaffolded in this, they, it builds. And finally, they have to reflect on the role of core values. So how has the core value of EWMTA shaped your coalition? And then how do you envision your coalition working together and applying the core value of EWMTA? So I would imagine that if the student was a leader in their community, that they would then you know, set up those values for the community um, to work together toward a common goal. Last thoughts, Teresa. Okay. So conclusion, perfect. <laughs> so here is just some kind of my overall conclusions. Um, challenges, it takes a lot of time to build curriculum. There's a lot, this is a PowerPoint, but I have documents upon documents that really the students use for this assignment. Um, sometimes they miss the spontaneity in the classroom. Uh, sometimes when I'm in a face-to-face -face classroom, I change things up, but there's some spontaneity online. And then I did find that collaborative learning was challenging. And like many of us, I'm going to be working on that. I have done collaborative learning in online environments, but I chose not to do it this past semester because students were just acclimating to the online environment. Kudos to those who did, though. Um, but opportunities, many, many opportunities, the use of digital media for autumn knowledge and diverse perspectives, the discussion boards are great. Um, it really can allow you to be creative. You can include outdoor experiences, uh, which I did do uh, in my class. They did outdoor field experiences. And finally, you know, online environments are, they increase accessibility and flexibility for students. So with that, I will stop. Great, thank you, Teresa. Um, I'm actually gonna ask you two questions because I think the first one is, is more just yes or no. So Sharon Parker is asking if uh, the video uh, from Camillus, the one on earth, air, fire, and water can be made available for one of her courses, Philosophy 101. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we have a Canvas site where we're collate, coll collating or gathering all of these videos as well as some of the curriculum that the learning community has done. And so uh, we will share that with everybody. I'll send you an invite, uh, Sharon, on that. And I think we're ready to open that up to go live. We talk about that every now and then. Are we ready to go live? <laughs> and then the second question that I that, that is interesting to me as well is uh, Linda Chappelle is asking, nice organization on the coalition project. But she's wondering what research resources do they work from? Oh, yeah, I have a whole set of um, resources uh, for the climate change part of it. Uh, we do rely on the national assessments in, of climate change. Um, and for the, let's see if I, here is the actual assignment. I can kind of pull it forward here. Uh, uh, just, it's always so challenging on this, these screens here. Um, so, for example, here I have a lot of links for students where they get examples on um, coalitions. Um, and uh, so there's, as I said, there's just different articles uh, that I share about coalition and teams. Um, so, th yeah, so these are some of the things that I use. And then, of course, for um, the presentation, I don't know if it's listed here, but it worked. They, they use the National Climate Change Assessment. Um, and so it's, there's actually, um, this is what I call the climate change impacts in your region assignments. 
and for the core values, um, this again is the YouTube um, video by Camillus on the core values. Great, thank you, Teresa. And as with everyone else, uh, Teresa's contact information is posted in the um, uh, chat and uh, we'll make sure she gets any of the other questions that everybody has. So, but let's move right along. Uh, our next presentation is from Dr. Hamadou Kieta, and he's doing a reflecting on teaching chemistry course online during COVID-19, outcomes and lessons learned. So Dr. Kieta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cordis, for giving me the chance to share my experience with my colleagues. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so as Curtis mentioned, I'll be talking about reflecting on teaching chemistry courses online during COVID-19, outcomes and lesson learned. So as you know, I started teaching at USCC this spring semester and I was teaching uh, two chemistry courses, that is chemistry and society and also general chemistry two. And each of these courses also have lab components. Um, so um, we have to send lab keys to students and have them perform the lab at home. Um, so I had students from different states and also a student from Japan. Um, so we had to get the lab kits to students on time. And fortunately, uh, we were able to get the student in Japan lab kit within a week, which was very impressive. So um, teaching lab face-to-face -face is, is very different from the online setting because you have to consider all the hazard involved in um, working with chemicals. Um, so we uh, have these lab kits, which include just the chemicals, the amount just that they need, uh, nothing more, uh, just to prevent some um, students from accident, basically. So um, before they, they, they start, the lab, I usually do a demo, explain the procedure and some of the safety precautions they have to be mindful um, before they perform this lab at home. So, so once I give them demos and, and emphasize the safety precautions they have to um, be mindful of, we, we go ahead and, and start the lab. So we have this side is called hands-on lab. Um, we have all the experiments there. The students can just log in with the email and, and, and password and they can access the experiments for that week. And so I will post the experiments on Canvas, which one is due every week. So after having a demo on a particular experiment, they'll go on, on the um, hands-on lab website to read the procedures, perform the experiment, and prepare the report and submit it on, on Canvas. Um, so that was very um, worrying for me because I think it was going to be very challenging to conduct lab online, uh, but with this lab kit, I think it was very effective and um, we didn't have any, uh, any issues uh, during the semester. Um, some challenges, technology challenges, um, at least on my side, um, is easy to write on whiteboards or blackboard in face-to-face -face setup. Um, but once you move online, some of these skills are not um, easily transferable. So when I want to explain something or I want to draw a sketch on Zoom whiteboard, it's difficult. Um, for the first few weeks, I thought I have to do something about this because it was slow trying to um, write something with my mouse or draw figures. Um, so I figured out 
um, there is this tool, it's called XPen. So I have the picture here, I bought it on Amazon. And it's basically like a face-to-face, -face, you have a whiteboard, you're writing on the whiteboard. So that made um, life a little bit easy for me. Um, so in case um, anyone is encountering um, that problem, you can also get one of your XPen and it, it was life-changing for me. And it also allowed me to explain um, certain concepts to students and make them um, understand those concepts in, in, in details and provide as many examples as possible. Um, anytime they ask me questions, I can also um, explain my answer, draw or demonstrate um, on the whiteboard. Um, so I also realized that students also um, face some technological challenges, uh, mostly internet issues. Um, it was difficult for some students to have consistent access to um, internet. So uh, once we start, some students will drop off from the Zoom meeting and they have to try to get in again. Um, so what I did was to record uh, my lectures and um, since it was a long lecture, three hours plus, at the end of the lecture, I will edit these videos using Biteable, you know, to um, cut out the the breaks we had during the lecture um, to make it sizable for the students to um, to review at their own time. So I was also very concerned about how to securely administer exams and tests online, um, because you know um, the online assessment always come with some potential for, for, for cheating. Uh, so my goal was to minimize cheating um, by devising some um, some some ways to um, assess my students without encountering cheating. So. So I, I had all my students take the test at the same time. And for the exams, I will have them propped over Zoom. Um, if, if possible, I will randomize my questions and the options so that no two students will have the same order of questions. Um, I'm also considering, in the future, I'm considering to um, use the lockdown browsers to prevent students from opening new tabs and um, looking up answers online. Um, so I did not start this. I didn't want to start this at the beginning of, at the middle of the semester because there are some challenges also trying to introduce something new um, in the middle of the semester. So if anyone used lockdown process before, before and had good experience, I would like to know um, your experience and how, uh, how you like it. Um, so here are some useful tools that um, I would like to share with you. I use a couple of them, like Canva for designing graphics and Writable for editing videos. Um, so uh, there are other resources that can be useful for your students. So if you are interested in any one of these, um, you, can, um, you can let me know. I will send you this link. Uh, and they are free, so that's a good thing. So in conclusion, uh, it was very difficult to switch from face-to-face -to, -face to online overnight, but it um, gave us an alternative to hold classes and um, stay on track where face-to-face -face was not an option. Um, so we still don't know how or when this is all going to end, um, but we do know from our experience, we can start our next semester with a very solid foundation of how to run um, classes online. Um, thank you very much. So that was my short presentation about my experience and um, lesson learned teaching um, last semester chemistry courses. Okay, thank you very much. You have 10 minutes. It's hard for me. I would have wanted to do it again. I know I did that if I did it one more. Thank you, Hamadou. That's a, you know, it's a, I think the science classes that require those hands-on experiences 
are especially difficult to do in this time of, of uh, online learning. And I'd applaud all the faculty who have had to use these kits and stuff and make it work. And so I think it's excellent. Um, we do have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Casador. He says, how do you get the X pin? Is it an app that you download? So the X pen, I actually bought it on on Amazon, and um, once you bought it, you can just connect to your computer, and there are some drivers you have to download from their website xpen.com. There are drivers that you have to download, and then you are good to go. Great, thank you. Um, and as with everybody, uh, Dr. Kieta's information is in the chat area and we'll definitely send him any other questions that you all may have. Thank you, sir. And uh, we will now, uh, we're to our last presentation of the day by uh, Professor Linda Chappelle. And I think this is a fitting topic to end on and it's keeping online students on track, tools and techniques. So uh, Linda, the floor is all yours. Hi, so if everybody's still awake, um, I am going to just talk a little bit about my system for getting my students to do their projects. As you know, I'm the art instructor um, so we do a lot of projects and like Hamadou, um, I was very, it was a challenge to move online. I've taught the design class in the summer. Of course, I finished it last spring online and then I taught it in the summer and then again in the fall. Um, so I've had some time to adjust. Um, the class um, consists of a lot of longer projects. And in the, in the classroom setting, I would normally, of course, you know, keep track of what they're doing and help them along um, because it is a lab class. So we have a lot of time to, to work on the projects in class. Um, and in order for the students to be successful, they really need to complete these longer projects. So uh, my challenge and my goal was to get the students, if I get every student to finish every project in that class, I am thrilled. So. I've gotten um, that this last semester, um, the spring, it was a challenge, the summer, I managed to do it, but summer students tend to be really focused. And then uh, this fall, uh, we, we did it successfully. So I'm gonna screen share and, and go through my little PowerPoint here. Um, so that said, um, that's kind of where the background is for this is, is just uh, working through. So I set it up here that there's, you know, kind of three topics here that I'm going to go over. One is just setting up a longer project for success. The second is ongoing feedback. Um, and the third is staying present. I teach the class uh, synchronous. So we do meet um, twice a week. Um, and that's a really big help, of course, with these classes. Um, so the first thing, of course, is I usually review the assignment guidelines. I give an overview um, of uh, the entire um, project. I'm trying to get rid of my chat box so I can see here. Um, to show examples of completed past student work. And I think that's really important um, as well as uh, going over the guidelines uh, first. Um, to show them that students have been successful in the past and that this is what the student work looks like when it's completed. Um, and then I include a discussion always of the assignment um, with the student learning outcomes. And then of course it's broken down chunk by chunk. So my assignment sheets look something like this where I discuss what our objective is. Um, I usually start with the visual example first um, so that they know what that looks like when they're done. You know, here's what your project looks like. Here's why we're doing it. Um, here's our design problem. So this is just the color wheel that we do. We do five big projects in this class. Um, this is about the middle of the semester when we do the color wheel. Um, and then as you can see here, I have guidelines here that we go through step by step. So the first day I show the example, we read through the guidelines and I kind of get them jazzed up and ready to go. 
Okay. Um, when we're planning the schedule, um, I engage them a little bit. I tell them, you know, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it this way. This is how I'm breaking it down. Um, and we always share um, and discuss that strategy of why we're doing it this way. My homepage um, has the schedule on it. When you open up the canvas, so the schedule, I'll show them, you know, here, and I keep it short, right? This is what we're gonna do with the color wheel. Here's our introduction, right? There's your homework. This is your demo, right? This is what we're gonna do the next day. So the first day I give them this big overview of what we're gonna do step by step. So I kind of get them going. I, you know, of course, field questions. Um, so we kind of have everything set up. So the due dates are set for the smaller parts on the schedule. Um, every due date, we review what the next one is. I open every class with the schedule. So the schedule will be like the first thing I do in class is I'll say, hey, here's, here's our schedule. Where are we at today? This is what we're gonna do today. Um, so I'll do that. I'll discuss and review the beginning of each class. Um, they participate in that. I ask them. That's part of the opening part of the class is I'll say, you know, did anybody have a problem getting done? Where are you, right? And if we have sticking points, we share those, right? I'll say, hey, in the past, some students have, have you know, had a hard time thinking of this or they've had a hard time painting, you know, this color or whatever it happens to be. So the first part of the class, we'll go over those steps. I'll take the time to ask each student again, because it's a, a lab class, I'll only have 10 students. So I have the time to do that to begin with. So that's kind of what we do. That's where it is, it's on the home page. So that's how we kind of start the class is, is looking over those, those times. Um, if necessary, whoops, sorry, if necessary, we will revise the schedule too. If I have, you know, five students that didn't get done, I'll be like, okay, you know, this, this means that we're going to have to, you know, hurry up with this part. Okay. And we'll, we'll make adjustments if necessary. I always leave a little like, you know, time for adjustments in the schedule. You know, I've taught the class long enough to kind of know how much it's going to take, but there are sticking points sometimes. So, um, so we do that. So if, if I change the schedule, we edit it together. So every day, that's kind of how we start. The feedback. So again, as we go along, there's feedback times set in so that we get feedback and they get feedback on how far they are. And, you know, if I see something like they've drawn a really complicated design and I know it's going to take them extra time to paint it, I'll let them know. I'll say, hey, that's beautiful. You might want to simplify it. If you're having a lot of homework or something going on this weekend, you might not be able to fully paint that in a weekend. So each step of the way we give feedback. Um, I check in again, you know, in that first part of the class, you know, as people are logging on, I'm checking in and we're looking at the schedule once everybody gets into the class. So that opening time, I've kind of learned how to use it just to check in with everybody and, and to talk about where they're at. Um, then we usually go into breakout rooms and that's part of the feedback process is I let them know that I'm not the only person to give feedback in the class that they get a lot of feedback from their peers and this is where students have really um, they gel together it helps them uh, you know sort of problem solve together uh, it helps them you know get encouragement from each other they really like the little um, breakout rooms that we do um, they share their progress so they're not just you know reporting to me they're reporting to each other so they help each other out i mix up the breakout rooms every class i'll have three students in a breakout room if at the initial check-in i know like somebody hasn't done it I'll make sure that they're, you know, I do kind of manipulate a little bit who I match up with who, because I'll put them, as I get to know them, I'll put them with a stronger student so that they'll, you know, kind of see that student's work and, and that student will be able to sort of show them where they're at. So I, you know, I always check in on the breakout rooms too. I don't just leave them floating there. Two I, more minutes, Linda. 
So that's how we do that with the ongoing feedback. So um, let's see, breakout rooms, there we go, sorry, wrong one. So we return and then I kind of summarize, you know, where everybody's at, you know, if, if they're in the breakout rooms, there were any sticking points, we'll go over them. I'll review the information that they might have missed if they didn't know how to mix a certain color or something, we'll hit on that. Lastly is staying present as the instructor. Um, I have gotten a little habit of after every class, I send a little announcement. And um, with staying present, the three things I've learned in the ACU class was um, being social, teaching, and cognitive. So I try to integrate these in um, as I chat on my announcements um, in a sort of familial voice, um, I include those. But I have a structure. So um, every class I send this afterwards, it's going to have the class summary, it's going to have the homework, it's going to say what we're going to do next class. And then I always have contact information with specifics. So my after class um, announcement will look something like this. I'll say, hey, thanks for a good class. It's kind of chatty, right? Next class, we're going to do this. Here's your homework specifically. And then out, as always, you know, when you're doing your homework, I'm here to help, right? You can get in touch with me. Sometimes these will be more specific, like if you forgot how to mix the paint, get in touch with me. So I send this after each class. Um, so this is another one, right? Next class, we're going to do this. You know, here's your homework. Every, every day is a little different, you know? If we change the schedule, I'll, I'll put it on those announcements, right? So after each class, I'll do one of those. I'll include like, hey, so-and-so shared this in the class. There it is. Um, of course, students are gonna fall behind. Um, that happens when somebody falls behind or misses a class. I chat. I send them in a chat box, hey, can you stay after class so that it doesn't feel, feel like they're, they're being called out in front of their classmates. Um, I'll send them an individual email if they don't show up. I'll re-summarize, you know, what we did. I'll get in touch with them. If necessary, I rework the schedule for individuals. I send them an agreement and an email saying, this is now your schedule to finish the project. Um, of course, I always offer encouragement. Um, and if necessary, I'll, I'll meet them one-on-one. -on -one. But so far, so good. Like I said, I was very, you know, happy. So in the end, just to summarize, those are the sort of three things that, that we went over here, how to get them through a long student, you know, student project, like making a color wheel. So setting them up, giving them ongoing feedback, um, and especially using their classmate peer feedback as a way to encourage them, and then staying present. So there we have it. Thank you, Linda. Right. And so your question is comes from uh, uh, Teresa Newberry. Being in art class, how do your how do your students turn in their work or show each other their work during a breakout room? Okay, so that's a good question. All my students have learned how to screen share, which is really helpful, but also a lot of times they just hold their stuff up. Like they're like, this is what I did. So <laughs> especially when it, they're in the sketches. So they do that. So that's kind of how we share in the breakout rooms. It's not always the best way to share our work, but I think in those little breakout rooms when they're sharing their sketches, the main thing is they're just show, you know, they're just encouraging each other and sort of showing each other. They do get pretty efficient with using the screen share. And I usually um, in the homework, sometimes I'll tell them, hey, you know, take a picture of your work so that they have it ready to share as a photo. Um, and so that that's a better way to screen share. And that's how they turn everything in. Everything is turned in on digital files and PDFs. Um, it's not always the best because for example, the color wheel, I have to just assume, you know, I can't be, in the classroom, I'd be much more picky about their color matching on the color wheel, but on digitally, because the monitor is never going to pick up paint the same way, I have to be a little, I give them a little more leeway. Great. Thank you, Linda. And, and I do have to say you're, you're, you're doing a talk on keeping students engaged. But the favorite part of this, this thing, too, is you have this ironic poster in the background that says leisure rules 
Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I'm in my niece's room. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> it cracks me up. Um, <laughs> Linda's information is also posted in the chat uh, if anybody has any additional questions. And with that being said, that is our final presentation. So now we're going to do a wrap up with uh, Dr. Octavia, Octaviana Trujillo. And then uh, Teresa is going to talk a little bit about uh, continuing this professional development into August. And then Carol uh, Henderson Don uh, will talk about our completion survey. These are important. Um, and then Camillus uh, will be giving us our closing blessing. So I'm going to turn the time over to Octaviana. Thank you, Curtis. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, that was part of a showcase, you know, from uh, Josh being the timekeeper, uh, Curtis being the facilitator, moderator, um, and we had uh, such tremendous uh, blessings for today, this afternoon's uh, um, gathering by Camillus. And uh, so everyone has really uh, uh, contributed enormously collectively to, to this afternoon. Um, I enjoyed this morning's presentations from our colleagues who are part of our uh, NSF project uh, with um, Teresa Newberry and the team. But all of you really um, shared with one another how you take a, a, a challenge, uh, a tremendous challenge that we had at the beginning of the academic year where everything had to be um, taught online. And if you had not had an opportunity before how to develop um, your uh, curriculum and how to use uh, Canvas uh, and all the online resources to, to really um, have full student engagement, certainly all of you have found um, strategies, uh, tools to help you along the way. And I believe that you've helped each other by really um, um, asking one another, I can't figure out how to do this. Like, how do we use a whiteboard? Or how do you do breakout rooms? And, and all of you have been doing this all year and you really have um, uh, fine tuned um, these skills um, that you've used to uh, engage your students. But everyone with video postings, journal entries and, and using uh, leadership activities uh, in creating um, solutions to challenges, uh, certainly, uh, for example, with, with uh, border issues uh, that was presented uh, earlier, peer evaluations, um, using photographs um, and then putting them into a slideshow presentation. Martha talked about that, the advising portal. Of course, everyone uh, may use or utilize discussion boards and of course the whiteboards and and uh, Linda talked about the, the breakout rooms. Um, I don't think I've I really have become skilled using the breakout rooms. Scaffolding, Teresa Newberry talked about how all the work that she does with uh, her units are all scaffolding uh, for uh, the, uh, um, actually uh, implementing all her objectives for her course. So thank you again. I think uh, all of you have uh, done a, a, a most, uh, marvelous job and just really keeping your students engaged, helping one another. And uh, especially when we know that some students don't have the best connectivity um, to be able to do all the needed work online. Thank you again. Be well. Thank you, Octaviana. Well, I'm going to make my remarks about the August professional development brief. Um, I just want to say I've really enjoyed the work we've done together as part of our faculty learning community. And I have learned so much from my colleagues. We have so much talent here. I am very uh, much in awe <laughs> of um, who we are at TOCC, and I'm glad we've had a chance to share what we do into our classroom. I've decided this is peer learning, but it also gives me a chance to peer into everybody's classroom. So <laughs> sorry about that pun, but I had to say it. Um, I 
so for the August professional development, we're still working on dates. And of course, they will be ongoing throughout the next year. So check your email and look for those dates. And we look forward to having you join us. And from here, I'm going to uh, pass it along to Carol to talk about our survey. Okay, Carol, we can't hear you. Oh, Carol? Yeah. We can't. How about now? Oh, now. now? Now we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really appreciated hearing from each one of you. It was very fascinating, and I learned a lot. Um, I, I have posted the post-session survey in the chat box. Um, I realized that there's been a couple of comments. Um, I did it about maybe 10 minutes ago. And uh, you should be able to just click on the Google Forms link that's there. Uh, we're going to give a few minutes to each, each um, person attending to complete the survey. It shouldn't take you that long. It's not, it's not um, very long. And if you have any difficulties getting into it, please let me know on chat, and I will be able to notify our team when everyone has completed the survey. So if you have any questions, um, I'm trying to, let me get back to the chat. I'm seeing it there. Are you able to see it, Teresa? No, I do not see it. I mean, the new one, did you post it again? Yes. Um, yes, yeah, I did. if you send me in an email, I can repost it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that works for you. Wait, did, did the does. link change? Uh, well, I posted it in the chat like about 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Is so it the same here link? Is... Yes. Uh-huh. Let me go okay. ahead and I'm just going to hit. Can you repost I'll... it, Josh? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'm, do it for I'm, you. Um, Okay. All right. And so I, I as we're doing it. that, oh, go ahead. I have it also. I just. Oh, there we go. There, it came through this yeah. time. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just posted it again. So everyone should be able to get into it. Yeah. Beauty of cut and paste, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so just to let so everyone know, I always play a little background music. Carol will let me know when most everybody's done. And uh, then uh, please stay for a closing blessing um, from Camilla. So probably in about five minutes. That should be enough time. And I'll be, um, yes. Josh, did you want to quit recording during this time? Oh, that would be a good idea. Yes, hold on. Okay. <laughs>